As a Chancellor of the University, uh, I'd like to welcome you all to this dialogue event. Uh, it's exactly the sort of debate which a great university should promote. Uh, as you know, we're going to listen to a discussion about the nature of human beings and the question of their ultimate origin. Um, the fact that there are so many people uh, crowding the Sheldonian, the fact that there are two other theatres in Oxford which are packed, and the fact that the proceedings are being streamed live uh, on the web um, to all parts of the world uh, does underline the importance of this event. Uh, I'm told that they're listening or going to listen to you in the middle of the night in Australia. We listen to cricket in the middle of the night. <laughs> they listen to these uh, more important uh, uh, matters, which just shows the difference between Australian culture and British culture. <laughs> um, obviously, the fact that there are so many of you uh, here uh, this afternoon is largely because of the eminence uh, of our uh, debaters, um, uh, Dr. Williams, Professor Dawkins, uh, and uh, Sir Anthony Kenny, uh, not only um, one of Oxford's great philosophers, but perhaps even more important, a former master of Balliol. <laughs> um, uh, it is wonderful that uh, uh, both Dr. Williams and Professor Dawkins, who of course have been associated with the university as, as uh, teachers and scholars uh, over the years, have uh, come to Oxford uh, uh, this afternoon, have come to the Sheldonian for this debate, so we're tremendously grateful to you. Now, there are many charming things about this theatre. Uh, as some of you who don't know already will discover, they don't include the seating. But if you think you're uncomfortable, you should try that throne up there, which is a complete nightmare. But one of the charms is, of course, um, the recently uh, renovated um, ceiling, uh, which shows, uh, uh, which has a depiction allegorically of the descent of truth on the arts and sciences, which is, of course, what we're going to experience. Uh, during the course of the next uh, um, uh, hour or more. So uh, without uh, any further remarks, I'd like to um, ask uh, Sir Anthony Kenny to uh, chair and, I'm sure, take part in the discussion. Thank you both, both for it. Thank you all very much. kind words. Um, I'd like to make a few housekeeping remarks uh, initially. Uh, the discussion uh, will last until 5.30, but it will end uh, quite promptly. Um, we are um, all agreed uh, that we would prefer there to be no applause, please, until, if you feel like it, at the very end. Um, a number of you have been kind enough to submit questions in advance. Uh, questions have been circulated to the three of us. Uh, and uh, what will happen is that if at a suitable point in the debate it appears to one or other of us that a question is particularly apposite, we will then read it from the cards which have been provided. Uh, I'm sure we all have cards in our own hands, but it's nice to have these trumps which have been uh, supplied. <coughs> uh, we are each going to make a brief introductory statement of our position, and then the discussion uh, will, we hope, flow freely. The topic is the nature of human beings, and the question of their ultimate origins. And we're going to take this pretty substantial question uh, in four stages. First of all, 
the nature of individual human beings now, of all of us. Uh, secondly, the origin of the human species as a whole. Thirdly, the origin of life on Earth. And finally, the origin of the universe. I think that should keep us going, probably, until <laughs> Thursday. We will be, as it were, tracing our ancestry backwards. Um, neither of my <coughs> fellow symposiasts need any introduction from me, but I'd like very briefly to introduce myself and say why I am sitting between these two protagonists. Um, I'm uh, myself a philosopher, uh, and I'm an agnostic about the existence of God. I don't know whether there's a God or not. I'm open to persuasion either way. Uh, I'm flanked by two people who claim to know the answer to the question I don't know the answer to. So I sit here as a representative of ignorance. <laughs> uh, Archbishop, may I ask you to introduce yourself? As well as being Archbishop of Canterbury, um, I've, over my career, taught theology and some philosophy in universities, particularly in this university and in Cambridge. Um, I have a long-standing interest in the history of theology and the history of what we rather unhelpfully call spirituality, that is how Christians pray and understand their praying, and also a long-standing interest in the arts in general and literature and drama and poetry in particular. So some of that will probably creep into what I say later. Do I say any more at this stage about the, the subject matter? Uh, perhaps, yes, yes I think. Yes. <laughs> well, let me then, um, to kick things off, venture a sort of definition. Human beings, it seems, are the only bit of the universe we know about that talks about the universe. The only bit of the universe we know about that seeks to represent the universe and makes claims about truth-telling. And because of that, we as part of that universe are able to affect the ongoing life of the universe in certain ways, some of which we understand clearly and some of which we don't understand at all clearly. There is in our understanding and our knowing an element of what you might call feedback into the life of the universe. And I guess that one of the things we might want to talk about is what kind of difference it is that human beings make, the nature of the freedom we exercise, or independence, within that universal order. But within that, I would say human beings as language users have a particularly powerful central role, and that's a question to our understanding, why and how do we use language? the relation of language and consciousness in this making a difference to the environment we share. It's not a matter of absolute discontinuity with the animal world around us, far from it. But if we are looking for distinctives, this seems to be the area where we look. And just to conclude a very brief position placement, it does seem that we live in a universe which, while we would all have difficulties, I suspect, with calling it anthropocentric, is anthropogenic. It's the kind of universe that has produced conscious language-using subjects, that is, us. And part of what we're looking at today is exactly how we understand that, whether there is a question we can answer about the origins of such subjects in the universe. So I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Well, first, I'd like to say what a privilege it is to be uh, discussing with Archbishop Williams. Um, I was very interested in, in the way you began, and um, it reminded me of two things which Julian Huxley said. Uh, one was, evolution has become conscious of itself, and he meant in humanity. And the other is a poem that he wrote, 
which I can't remember all of it, but um, it, it begins, the world of things entered your infant mind to populate that crystal cabinet. And I think that resonates with what you were saying, Archbishop, about the, the uniqueness, as far as we know, of humanity as being capable of, as I would put it, getting a model of the universe inside our heads. And I, no doubt we'll come back to this, to this idea. I think it's extremely interesting. Um, I was singing to myself in the shower this morning, and I, found, I realized that it was a, a hymn. I'm a, I'm a cultural Anglican. Um, I'm not going to sing it now. I, I, will, I, will, just, um, say, I, I will just say it. Um, it it's, it's a hymn that we probably all know. Um, it is a thing most wonderful, almost too wonderful to be. I'm afraid the hymn goes off the rails rather after that point. That's where it picks up. <laughs> um, but um, I think that um, it is a thing most wonderful, almost too wonderful to be, that at least on this planet and possibly on billions of other planets, but certainly on this one, the laws of physics have conspired to make the collisions of atoms get together to produce nothing that any physicist would have dreamed of, but to produce things like us, to produce plants, trees, kangaroos, uh, insects, and us, to produce collections of matter, collections of atoms that don't just obey Newton's laws in a passive way, they don't obviously disobey them, but not in a passive way, but which move and jump and spring and hunt and flee and mate and think, at least in our case, um, which is a quite astonishing thing to have happened, and we know since 1859 how it happened. Uh, and it's almost too wonderful to believe, but we have to believe it because we now know it's true. It's almost too wonderful to, to believe that um, the laws of physics working through this very remarkable process that Darwin called natural selection has produced these gigantic collections of apparently purposeful beings which look overwhelmingly as though they had been designed. They carry a a terrific illusion of design which fooled humanity until the middle of the 19th century. Um, now, I think that Darwin's achievement in doing that uh, was not only a magnificent achievement in itself, but it was a, a triumph of science which can be generalized to science generally because once Darwin had solved the problem of how you can get big, complicated, purposeful, and apparently designed things out of very simple beginnings. Once Darwin had solved that problem, it then gives courage to the rest of science that the same thing can be done in general and that we shall end up understanding literally everything as springing from almost nothing or according to some modern physicists, even literally nothing. And I think that that is a, a truly wonderful thought. When I say almost too wonderful to be, it's a thought that is extremely hard to comprehend and believe, and many people have great difficulty in believing it, and resort to uh, what, in my view, is, is an unsatisfactory uh, resolution to the problem, which is to say, an intelligence did it. That seems to me to be an evasion of the, of the question, an evasion of the scientific responsibility to understand how things come about, how complicated things come about in terms of... of um, simple things. So I'll stop there for Thank you. Um, you began by agreeing quite a bit with each other, and then tended, you particularly Richard, to some disagreement. Before I stoke that disagreement, uh, I'd like to make sure that we do agree on three very simple things. That is, that the three of us all believe in truth, namely that there is such a thing as objective truth. And it's not just an ideological construct to keep the lower classes down or whatever <laughs> postmodernists say. Secondly, that we all believe in logic. That is, 
that we think that if two statements flatly contradict each other, they can't both be true. And thirdly, that we all believe in science, that we think it is one of the greatest of human achievements, and that we all owe the scientists of many generations a great debt of gratitude for the way in which they have improved the world. Is there any dissent to that or qualification? No. <laughs> Good. Now, can I um, suggest a, a line of disagreement or uh, ask for clarification of what you said? You said that um, the laws of physics were, of course, never disobeyed by atoms, and I'm sure that's true. You also said the laws of physics have created us. Now, it seems to me that there are two different things there. There's um, nobody is going to say that the laws of physics are being regularly broken. But that doesn't say that the laws of physics alone determine what happens. In a game of chess, nobody breaks the rules, but the rules of chess do not dictate the game. That, of course, is absolutely true, and uh, the equivalent of the, um, of the rules of chess would be um, natural selection, the process of random variation, random change in the genetic codes, uh, followed by non-random natural selection. And it is the non-random process of natural selection filtering the random input from mutation, uh, which ultimately creates uh, living things. So um, the laws of physics are being obeyed all the time at the, at the lowest level. And the complexity is the same sort of complexity as when you play chess, when a computer plays chess, um, when a computer does anything for that matter. I mean, the computers are only machines in which electrons are whizzing around obeying the laws of mm -hmm. physics. But um, the, the, the layers of complexity on top of that, the layers of software complexity, um, produce the ability to play chess or do a spreadsheet or, or, mm -hmm. or, or whatever it is. And that, that's where one of my questions comes in. You spoke about how Darwinian selection offers a, a complete explanation of how we are here and why we're here. Darwin doesn't seem to me to have very much to say that helps with the problem of consciousness, which both philosophically and scientifically remains an enormous area, which I don't see very much advance in, in the scientific explanation of. And one of the things which makes me wary of simply saying we re have recourse to the laws of physics and that's it, is the question of consciousness. What is it that grounds the, the first-person perspective which we are currently sharing yeah. in this discussion? I agree that that is deeply mysterious. Um, as a materialist, I suppose I'm committed to the view that consciousness is something that emerges from brains, within, within brains. Um, nobody understands how, and I regard that as one of the problems for the future. Uh, and uh, I think it will be solved it, eventually by a combination of neuroscience and computer science, probably. Um, what I would say is that it, it, when one identifies a problem that science has, such, such as consciousness, and says, um, we don't yet understand X, and it happens to be consciousness in this case, um, then we should remain agnostic, as Sir Anthony has said, uh, what we shouldn't do is immediately jump to, I don't understand it, therefore it must have something to do with God. And, and, yeah, so, and, yeah. and I'm not suggesting that yeah. we, we buy in God to get us a, right. a cheap get-out-of-jail card on consciousness. <laughs> but what I am interested in is what it means to say that this is the kind of universe in which consciousness will happen given these, these coordinates. Because it seems to me that the question is not, is there some point at which God interferes to say, let there be consciousness. The question is, does an entire universe, a system of physical law, which produces something not obviously physical, does that require some context of intelligence that is not simply the intelligence of one finite? I think that's the question we're going to be discussing in our fourth stage, right, the try. origin of the universe. I'll back so, off. So, <laughs> uh, without it's leaping straight to God, uh, can I ask about the soul? Uh, mm. Consciousness uh, is something we share with animals. Uh, a lot of the higher animals are, are, are conscious too. So uh, uh, if we're talking about something special to human mm. beings, I think it isn't consciousness. 
but uh, many people have thought that human beings have special souls, souls which are different from any animal psychic organism, and souls which are immortal. Can I ask if you think that is correct? I'd want to go in between those two um, poles of consciousness as an obvious fact about animal life and something called the soul, and ask about self-consciousness, about the capacity of human beings to tell stories about themselves. We are beings who tell ourselves about ourselves, ask questions about ourselves. St. Augustine saying, I have become a question to myself as a definition of the life of human spirit. We tell jokes, we fantasize, we empathize, we even pray. Um, all of that is an activity of self-reflexive consciousness in a way which doesn't seem to, to fit at the, the animal level. And that seems to me to have something to do with the fact that some of us believe we are capable of a relationship with that unconditional creative energy that we call God. And all of those things about our self-awareness, about our self-questioning, have their home in the context of material beings who are nonetheless capable of that sort of relation. So I'm, I'm wary of talking about a soul as if it were, as in the cartoons, you know, a rather ghostly form of the body that sort of flies away into the middle distance. And I'm happier with a tradition you'll be very familiar with, talking about the soul as the form of the body. This is, this is how this particular kind of material being has meaning, has communicative and self-communicative capacity. And is this capacity for self-consciousness the Aristotelian type of soul, is that created by God in each individual, or is it inherited from the individual's parents? I don't believe it's created directly by God, as if there, there is a, a list in heaven that God ticks off sending you know, people down in, mm -hmm. in strict succession. It's something which, as several of the early Christian theologians say, <coughs> emerges in the material life of people subject by subject. It's to me, very interesting that in the fourth century you have a theologian like Gregory of Nyssa saying some quite evolutionary sounding things and saying, well, the soul doesn't come in separate. The soul is what gathers all this together when the material processes of development are complete. It's not that extra thing which has to be injected. Do you believe in but, a soul? Well, I think, I think that um, consciousness, that phrase gathering, gathering together, is, is possibly quite insightful about what actually happens about, about consciousness in the development of, of, a, ba of a baby. And, and I think that it's quite, there's been quite good suggestions that a, that a baby is a sort of uh, mixture of a, an assortment of different semi-individuals who gradually fuse themselves together to become what we think of as our individuality, as our, as our conscious self. And I think there are some philosophers who feel that consciousness should be seen as a kind of illusion um, to, to bring together all the different aspects of our, of our mind. But I, I thought, Archbishop, you didn't really answer what Sir Anthony was asking, because he, he wanted to know whether you believe the soul survives death. And, and, you didn't um, actually ask me that, but I'm quite happy to come well, to it. <laughs> I, I thought you did. did you? Uh, at, at the very beginning, but yeah, you're quite beginning. right, I didn't in the last night, but please answer. <laughs> <laughs> The short answer is yes, the long answer would take quite a while, so bear with me a moment. <laughs> um, what it is that we develop in self-consciousness, in relationship to others and to God, is, for myself as a Christian, something which does not simply cease on material death. What it means that it doesn't cease, what it is for that relationship with God to advance, blossom, come home, I have no idea. I have a number of images, but no idea. And the confidence that I as a Christian have about that is not the belief that there's something in me that will survive. It's a belief in the kind of God who does not terminate the relationship initiated from God's side as I develop and grow. But could, could I just come back very briefly on, on one, of, um, one of your phrases about um, consciousness as an illusion? Yes. I, I've come across this sort of language, and I have to say it baffles me, rather. Yes. Because if consciousness is an illusion... What isn't? I mean, the, the concept of an illusion presupposes that there is yeah, that's, a that's, that's correct enough, yes. that's, way of that's perceiving. Enough, yeah. And I find that there's a lot of that slippage going on in some of the writing in this area. Um, consciousness is a mistake. 
But to talk about mistakes, we have to have a framework in which it makes sense to distinguish between a mistake and a correct observation. Consciousness is an illusion, but we need, therefore, a distinction between illusion and correct perception, or even, well, I could go on, but you, you see the point. Yes. And to say that consciousness is something emerging to resolve the problems, if you like, of a discrete ETE perception is not quite the same as saying it's an illusion, or to say yes, with Daniel right. Dennett that uh, there is no evidence for consciousness. I scratch yes. my head um, profoundly. <laughs> <laughs> I have a colleague who, who um, when one gets into this argument and, and they get, come to the point where one says, well, we don't act actually have any evidence that any of the rest of us are con Maybe I'm the only one, only one who is and so on. Um, and he, he finishes the conversation by saying, I'm not conscious. <laughs> The, so thing the, that, moment, yes, the, the thing that, that, that really baffles me ab about consciousness is that I can kind of see that uh, one could program a computer to behave exactly as though it were, were conscious, to pass the Turing test and actually fool people into thinking that it was conscious. But I still have trouble believing it actually would be, and yet I think I have to be committed to the view that it, that it, that it would be. Um, well, I think it's sad that you're committed to that view. I think it's rather sad that you're committed to that view. Well, why? Computers are human tools. They, 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 they can't even add two and two together. They are uh, tools that are used by human beings, by human programmers. They can't even tell the time, and they wouldn't know what to do it if they did. Put, put, it, put it another way, if I may. Um, computers are... Um, I am a, scientific illiterate here, but computers are binary systems, essentially, aren't they? That, that's what uh, they work at, the, at bottom, they are, 